so thank you to the organizers most of whom don't seem to be in here yet but thank you for putting up this really nice program over the last seven weeks uh it's really nice to be here it's great interacting with everyone and i'm happy that i have the chance to talk about some of our recent work so this is something that we have been doing at slack with alex and his phd student payal and so there were two talks on nucleosynthesis last week by alex and rebecca and so one of so rebecca talked about neutron rich nucleosynthesis and then alex talked about proton rich nucleosynthesis and then now gail will also be giving a talk in another half an hour once i have wrapped up so alex in his talk last week already gave a sneak peek into what we are trying to do here but i'll have the chance to go into a little bit more detail on that so what i'm going to do in the beginning is to give just a little bit of context for what we are doing and why we are doing it so this is the uh, periodic table of elements a really nice picture i like this a lot uh, so it shows some of the different uh, at astrophysical mechanisms for producing elements in the periodic table and it shows which isotopes are predominantly produced by which mechanism now even though i like this picture a lot you know by the end of my talk i hope to convince you that there should be some changes uh, to this periodic table and in particular i want to try and convince you that there should be some of these yellow squares in these boxes that correspond to molybdenum and ruthenium and this is the periodic table as you see it in chemistry textbooks but if you open a nuclear physics textbook instead this is what you will see and so you have a proton number uh, on the y axis and neutron number on the x axis so this is the neutron rich side of the you know chart of isotopes and this is the proton rich side so if you squint closely enough you'll see that there is this line of uh, black squares which represent stable nucleides and if you look carefully enough you see that it's sort of trimodal so there is this uh so majority of these nucleides lie along this central black line and then there is a small branch on the neutron rich side and a small branch on the proton rich side and you can see it more clearly if you zoom in on any particular section so predominantly most of these stable nuclei are along this line and then there's some here which are proton rich some here which are neutron rich so the basic picture is that you produce most of these ones in the s process which is like slow neutron capture and by slow what that means is that the neutron capture rate is small compared to the rate of uh, beta decays uh, then the ones that are here on the right you have to they are more neutron rich so you have to make them through the r process which is rapid neutron capture and by rapid this means that you know in between any two beta decays you get many many neutron captures uh on the contrary the nuclei that are on the other side of this center line so those are more proton rich and so you can't make them by capturing neutrons because they are shielded from this direction so the only way to make these uh, nuclei are either you create a proton rich plume which then undergoes you know beta decay or np exchange or something like that or you make these s process elements first and then somehow post process them to go in this direction so like the distinction is that one like one category is like a primary process where you just populate this plume and then it beta decays and then the other type of processes are secondary processes where you make these ones and then go that way using some transmutation but the nomenclature in this field is that anything that makes you know these isotopes on the proton rich side is collectively referred to as the p process so from my point of view what makes proton rich nucleosynthesis interesting is that it is sort of difficult and that's because of the coulomb barriers so the easiest example of this is the early universe where you have a high entropy and you have at high temperatures all the everything is in nuclear statistical equilibrium and it freezes out from nsc at about 0.1 mev where you basically make alpha particles and the moment you make alpha particles you are already at 0.1 mev and 
the moment you drop lower than that, you have Coulomb barrier, so you can't capture protons anymore. So in our proton-rich boring universe, you basically only make alpha particles and trace uh, quantities of a few other lighter elements. Now, hypothetically, if you had a universe where you had more neutrons than protons, say if the neutron was lighter than the proton, then things might look much more interesting, that you could probably make heavy elements in the early universe. But unfortunately, we don't have that. So nevertheless, it's an interesting thought experiment as to what would happen if the early universe had a much lower entropy, like 100 instead of 10 to the 10. And what makes this an interesting thought experiment is that this figure is actually typical of what you might get in a neutrino driven outflow in a core collapse supernova. So yeah, so proton rich nuclear synthesis is hard, but nonetheless you do see these proton rich heavy elements in nature. So you see them in the solar system in meteorites. So this is a figure from a review article by Rauscher in 2013. And this data is collected from like solar and meteoric, meteoritic data by Lauders and by Anders and Gravese. So then the next, like when you see this, uh, it begs the question that how do these abundances actually compare with the R or S process abundances in similar regions? And so you can answer that by making a direct comparison. So this is from Brad Mayer uh, review in 1994. So this is the P process branch and then the ones up here are R and S process. So by and large, what you see is that the P process abundances are generally one or two orders of magnitude lower than the corresponding neutron rich abundances at the same mass number, with the exception of this peculiar region between mass number 90 and 100 where the abundances are actually more comparable. And so the nucleides or the proton rich nucleides of interest in this region are 92-94 molybdenum and 96-98 ruthenium. And in addition to the solar system and in meteorites, you also find these things in metal pore stars in the Milky Way. Uh, so this is like a function of the observed molybdenum and ruthenium abundances as a function of metallicity. And one thing that's interesting to note here is that at low metallicities, you see this large scatter, which suggests that whatever process is making molybdenum and ruthenium might have some intrinsic variability in it. So can come back, we'll come back to this point later in the talk. And so I mentioned earlier that generically anything that makes these proton rich elements is referred to as a P process. And so there are many different kinds of P processes that have been suggested in literature over the last few decades. So one of them is the gamma process, which is a secondary process. So here you first make S or R process nucleides and then convert them into proton rich nucleides through photo disintegration. So this can happen in explosive shell burning in massive stars or in exploding white dwarfs. So the problem with this is that it makes, so I'm thinking, you know, from the point of view of making molybdenum 92, 94 and ruthenium, 96, 98. So from that point of view, the issue with this process is that it can make some 92 molybdenum, but not much of any of the other ones. Uh, then you have the new, pro new process, uh, which George has also worked on in the 90s. So this is basically when you have neutrino fluxes high enough that the small cross sections can be offset by just large fluxes. And you can again transmute stable nuclei through neutrino capture. And this can happen in core collapse supernovae, of course, because you have large neutrino fluxes there, but it requires like some very special set of conditions. Like it's somehow you have to have an outflow which remains in close proximity to the neutrino, uh, to the neutron star for extended periods of time. And this can be difficult to implement. So then you have the classic RP process, which is a primary process. So there you just build up the nucleosynthetic plume through a sequence of uh, proton captures, P gamma, followed by beta plus decays. And the problem with this is that some of these beta plus decays have extremely long lifetimes. And so you, you capture some protons, then you wait for that nucleus to beta decay, and you can't proceed any further until it finishes decaying. And because that lifetime is so long, by the time you're done waiting, the system has cooled down and you can't capture protons anymore because of the Coulomb barriers again. So with the RP process, you can get maybe a little bit beyond ion 56, but not too much. 
uh, and then there is the alpha process, which you get again in neutrino driven outflows in core collapse supernovae. But for that, you need like a very specific uh, set of electron fractions, just close to 0.5, but very slightly less than 0.5. So this has a similar issue that the gamma process has in that you can make some molybdenum 92, but not much 94 or 96, 98. But one interesting aspect of this process is that through this process, you can actually make appreciable amounts of this other proton rich nucleoid niobium 92. And you make niobium 92 in this process in amounts that are comparable to the molybdenum 92 uh, production yields. So We'll come back to this point later as to why this is important. So then next we come to the new P process, which is the meat of this talk. Uh, so this new P process was proposed in 2005 by Karla Felix and collaborators. And the idea behind this is that this looks like the RP process, but you have like a subdominant neutron population in a proton rich outflow, which can help you bypass these beta decay beta plus decay waiting points through NP or N gamma reactions. And so there are also some other papers which were almost concurrent with Carla's paper. And so this is why Vanajo calls this process the neutrino induced RP process because you basically have a free protons and then through new bar capture on free protons, you generate a subdominant neutron population and that helps you bypass these beta plus decay uh, waiting points. And so broadly speaking, this is how the, this is what the physics of the new P process looks like. So you have at very high temperatures, everything is in nuclear statistical equilibrium. You know, all the nuclear species talk to each other. Then as you cool, the NSE turns into QAC, which is nuclear quasi equilibrium, where not all the species are simultaneously talking to each other, but instead you have these little uh, islands or clusters within which you have local, uh, so equilibrium. And then by the time you get to three giga Kelvin, you just freeze out of all kinds of equilibria. And then and by that point, you have produced seed nuclei all the way up to nickel 56. And if you start out with a proton rich outflow, then you have seed nuclei and you have free protons. But then in between say three giga Kelvin and 1.5 giga Kelvin, you can convert some of these free, neutron, uh, free protons into neutrons through new bar capture. And you don't need too many of them. You can have neutron fractions, which are as small as 10 to the minus 12 or 10 to the minus 11. And that's already enough to have enough neutrons to bypass these beta plus decay waiting points. And this continues all the way up until 1.5 giga Kelvin, which is about 0.1 MeV, at which point the Coulomb barrier stop any further proton captures from happening. So it's interesting though. So those of, so, so those of, uh, so those people who work on the R process, so in their minds, like neutrinos are the enemy because they destroy neutrons. So when I'm thinking about the new P process, I think of the CP conjugate of that statement, which is that anti-neutrinos are our friend. So like just this simple physics argument can lead you to infer that what are the favorable conditions for the new P process. So one thing you need is you want a short, time interval in the pre freeze out regime and you want a high entropy per baryon in the outflow. Now both these things together conspire to give you a high proton to seed ratio at freeze out, which is desirable if you want to build up to heavier elements. And then secondly, you want a long time interval in the band where the proton capture actually happens, like where the plume actually grows. And so these three conditions were described in this really nice paper by Vanajo in 2011. So like this was just the basic structure of the new P process. But then ever since it was proposed in 2005 over the last decade and a half, a number of people and groups have pointed out potential difficulties that can arise with this new P process. And many of them are related to not being able to produce these uh, proton rich isotopes either in the right ratios to explain their solar abundances or you just don't produce enough of them or you produce like some of them but not others. So there are a number of groups that have uh, suggested these difficulties. Then there is this 
a curious puzzle of niobium 92 so niobium 92 is a proton rich nucleus which you cannot make in the nupi process because it is shielded by molybdenum 92 so if you make a proton rich plume and then it has to beta decay then the molybdenum sort of gets in the way of the niobium so you don't make niobium uh, it can be made in the gamma process because in the gamma process you are sort of going the other way you are making the neutron rich things first and then transmuting them and what's interesting is that conveniently the production ratio of niobium to molybdenum that you get in the gamma process if you combine that with some appropriate model for galactic chemical evolution and interstellar medium mixing that is roughly consistent with the ratio that you can infer uh, from observations the ratio that has to be there in the early solar system as inferred from observations so this is nice but what is what i find a little bit strange is that this is used as an argument that anything any process that produces molybdenum has to concurrently produce niobium in the same ratio that should explain the solar system abundance now i find that there i think there are two issues with this argument uh, one issue is that both these ratios i mean the production ratio and the observed ratio in the solar system they have significant uncertainties you know 20% 30% 50% basically order one uncertainties so that leaves a lot of room to do many other things uh, and then the second issue is that even if that ratio were you know accurately determined that does not preclude there being two separate processes that you know where one of which uh, contributes predominantly to niobium and another process predominantly contributes to molybdenum so this is sort of a possible i mean i am like this could be a resolution of the niobium puzzle and we'll come back to that maybe towards the end of the talk if there is time uh, but then last but not the least this is like this was the issue that actually prompted us to look at this problem so it was pointed out initially in by vanajo that uncertainties in the triple alpha reaction rate so triple alpha going to carbon 12 uh, that could have implications for new p process yields and the argument was that if you increase the triple alpha uh, rate to carbon 12 then you make more seeds and then you end up with a smaller ratio of protons to seeds which is not good uh, so beard et al in 2017 actually calculated this in medium triple alpha enhancement and then subsequently it was implemented in the new p process calculation by jin et al in 2020 and there was a nature paper uh, and they came to the conclusion that the suppression of heavy element nucleosynthesis due to the triple alpha reaction cast significant doubt on the new p process being the explanation for molybdenum and ruthenium and so because it was a nature paper there was a press release and there were emphatic statements like certain isotopes are not made in the way scientists originally thought they were uh, so then that got us to think that well are things really this bad or maybe are there ways around this statement and we were well equipped to think about this problem because at that point alex and pyle were already uh, working on a model of like a semi analytic model of neutrino driven outflows which they were applying in the context of oscillation signals but then this model was there and it was waiting to be applied also to a problem like this so that's what we tried to do and so what had already been discovered by alex and pyle was that neutrino driven outflows you know depending on the exact boundary conditions can be either supersonic or subsonic and in fact for the typical conditions that are found in core collapse supernova environments they often are near critical and so they are very sensitive to the boundary conditions like a small change in boundary conditions can push them one way or the other and so this effect can actually be we can actually try to exploit this effect to our advantage but before that just a very quick uh, description of what these uh, what this self analytic uh, outflow model looks like so these are basically equations that you learn in kindergarten this is mass conservation this is newton's law this is energy conservation or you know the first law of thermodynamics and if you make assumptions about what the conditions near the proton neutron star look like 
for example, if you assume that there is radiation domination, then you can convert this into other variables like temperature, entropy, and you get a set of coupled ODEs. Uh, what makes it interesting is that these coupled ODEs have mixed boundary conditions, like some of them have known conditions at the near boundary, some of them have known conditions at the far boundary, so you have to combine them in intelligent ways to be able to integrate these equations. But you can do that, and depending on these boundary conditions, you can get supersonic or subsonic outflows. So we did that, and we discovered that if you have subsonic outflows, then they are actually much more conducive to getting good new P process yields as compared to supersonic outflows. Now, there are two reasons for this. So one reason is that with subsonic outflows, the outflow spends much more time in this 3 giga Kelvin to 1.5 giga Kelvin band, which is quantified by the tau 2 time scale from Monajo. Uh, and also in subsonic outflows, the material doesn't get pushed as far as quickly as it does in supersonic outflows. So the outflow material remains closer to the neutron star. And so if it's closer to the neutron star, it sees a higher flux of neutrinos. And so then you basically get a greater integrated fluence of nu e bar, and then you can make more neutrons and which allows the plume to grow bigger. So triple alpha enhancement is still there and it still hurts the process. Like it suppresses the yields to some extent. But if you have good yields to begin with in your base model without enhancement, then the triple alpha process doesn't completely kill new P. Uh, one other thing that we found was that to actually get yields that are consistent with solar system observations, uh, you need to have uh, high, rather high proton neutron star masses. So 1.8 solar mass. So this is high, but this is not crazy. I mean, we know that there exist neutron stars which are all the way up to two solar masses. And also in some of the recent numerical simulations of you know supernova explosions of heavy progenitors, there is an extended accretion phase which results in heavy proton neutron stars being produced. So this is not completely crazy. So this was this is kind of our money plot in the paper that we are writing. So this is a comparison between the results from the nature paper, which we reproduced uh, using their uh, parameterized outflow profile. And then this is the subsonic outflow profile that we use. So you can see that this looks different from this. So this is the temperature versus time curve for both of them. And this yellow band is the band between three giga Kelvin and 1.5 giga Kelvin. So for this uh, parameterized supersonic looking outflow profile from Jin et al. The yields are actually not that great to begin with, even in the base model. So when you put triple alpha enhancement on top of that, it basically kills everything. So then you're not going to get any appreciable numbers of molybdenum or ruthenium. But then in this subsonic outflow model, if your base yields are already very good to begin with, you get a little bit of suppression, but you're still okay. And so this is like the basic zeroth order comparison between the supersonic, the supersonic parameterized model versus our subsonic outflow semi-analytic model. And so these calculations were done using the open source Skynet reaction libraries, which are available online. And the triple alpha enhancement was also implemented using a publicly available code that was written by the authors of JIN. So that, you know, that made it life very easy for us. And in our calculations, we take a decaying neutrino luminosity with a time constant of three seconds. Uh, and we take initial YE to be 0.6. And our nuclear synthesis trajectories are basically a sequence of steady state snapshots that we calculate using this semi-analytic outflow prescription. And for this uh, outflow prescription, we adopt the far boundary condition, you know, far density or far pressure from these suite of simulations by Sukhbold et al, which are described uh, from 2016. So this is just, so this is not a movie, this is just a snapshot. I can show movies. Hopefully I'll have a little bit of time in the Q&A session to show movies, but this is what it looks like. So this is the chart of the nucleides and this, you can see this proton rich plume growing and eventually it will beta decay back to stability and it will make molybdenum and ruthenium and a bunch of other proton rich nucleides. So then we started looking at different things. So we looked at different progenitors. So this one is a 13 solar mass progenitor. This one is an 18 solar mass progenitor. And for each of them, we have a sequence of 
uh, outflow snapshots at different post bounce times. So in, in both cases, we used this heavy proton neutron star with 1.8 solar mass and a 19 kilometer radius. And if you look carefully here, you will see that the optimal windows of time during which the yields are best are different for different progenitors. So for this one, the optimal window is between one second and 1.6 seconds. For this one, it is between 1.4 seconds and two seconds. But across a reasonable range of progenitor masses, these optimal windows are usually within the first two seconds post bounds. And that is good because during those early times, the mass outflow rates are still appreciable because you need that, right? There's no point making these nucleides if you can't drive them out of the explosion. So generically for a reasonable range of progenitor masses, you can get these good yields. So you don't need a lot of progenitor fine tuning. So that's always nice. Uh, and what we can do is we can take these sequence of snapshots and we can convert them into integrated yields. So this is basically just a time averaged uh, abundance, which you can then divide by the observed solar abundance. You have to make sure that you're normalizing all those things correctly so that you know, all the mass fractions add up to one and all that. And from that, you can define a production factor, which is the ratio of the calculated abundance to the observed abundance. Uh, and then you can define an overproduction factor, which is basically this number multiplied by an astrophysical dilution factor. And then dilution factor is like the mass of the neutrino driven ejecta divided by the mass of the total ejecta. And that factor tends to be around 10 to the minus four. Now to explain the solar system abundance of a nucleide, the general consensus is that this overproduction factor has to be 10 or more. And then that translates to this production factor being about 10 to the five or more. And so for this 13 solar mass progenitor calculation, this is what you get. So these are, this is the abundance relative to solar. So you can see that these are above 10 to the five. So this is a, this red dashed line is actually the exact calculation rather than the order of magnitude one. So you can see that all of them are close to the red line or thereabouts. And also importantly, so this is like, these are the ones that are of interest for the new P process. And the abundances of like the relative abundances of all these nucleides when divided by the respective solar abundances are all within a factor of 10 of each other. So you are doing two things with this. You are ensuring that you have the correct absolute abundances and you're also ensuring that you have the correct relative ratios. So it solves both of those problems that I mentioned earlier. So we are basically showing existence proof that you can have a realistic simulation where you get good absolute yields and relative yields. And this is again a snapshot from another movie. This is the alpha process, which I also discussed earlier. So this is our solution to the niobium problem. So in the new P process, you don't make niobium. So you have to make it some other way. And there is, we found that there is another way that you can make it. And this was already shown in the nineties by George and Hoffman and Woosley and collaborators. So you can see this plume looks different from the plume that we had earlier. So the plume that we had earlier was going on the proton rich side and then decaying back to stability. But this one just runs along the line of stability because it is primarily built through alpha particle captures. And so this is how you make, sorry, so this is how you make niobium 92 because if the plume goes along the line of stability, then you are not shielded by molybdenum. So then basically you can make the correct ratio of niobium to molybdenum, presumably in the neutrino driven outflow by like having regions with different Y in the correct ratio. So then we looked at after showing existence proof, we looked at variability because we know that the yields depend on entropy and the entropy in turn depends on things like the proton neutron star mass and radius. So we just tried changing those parameters to see how much they affect the yields. Here you can see that the yields get worse with decreasing proton neutron star mass, which is what you expect because the entropy gets worse. Uh, likewise, the more compact the proton neutron star becomes, the entropy increases so the yields get better. And this has connections to the equation of state because let's say hypothetically, if at some point you can prove conclusively that all the molybdenum and ruthenium was indeed made in the new P process, then you can turn that around and you can say that, okay, then the proton neutron star radius has to be within this range. And that 
gives you theoretically a constraint on the equation of state. Uh, likewise, the mass dependence is an indicator of variability. Now, remember the metal pore star figure I showed earlier on, which had this scatter at low metallicity, which indicated that the process producing molybdenum or ruthenium may have some intrinsic variability. Well, there is some variability here. So that's also nice to see. So yeah, so this is basically covers much of what we did in this paper, which should hopefully be out soon. And the conclusion, one of the conclusions is that at least for the time being, new P process seems to be alive and well. And the hydrodynamics of the outflow are very crucial in determining what happens. So to get robust new P process yields, it helps to have subsonic outflows. And that works even if you implement the enhanced triple alpha rate. Oh, and by the way, all these calculations that I showed, these were using the enhanced triple alpha rate. And so we were, we were getting good yields in spite of that. And because you need a high entropy, you want heavier proton neutron stars or you know, a favorable equation of state, which makes them more compact. And so connections to future work, the fact that you have this variability suggests that there is a bridge to galactic chemical evolution where you can convolve the yields from different progenitor simulations with some kind of an initial mass function and some galactic chemical evolution model. I already mentioned equation of state. There is also a dependence on Ye, which I did not show, but we have done calculations on that. And I think I may have some plots in the bonus slides. Uh, forgot to put the year on this, but there was a paper by Andre and Yong Chen and Mani Brata. Uh, yeah, and so this dependence on Ye also motivates that you might want to do a calculation which also has neutrino oscillations in it because neutrino oscillations directly feed into Ye. And ultimately, all of this framework has to be eventually tested by running nucleosynthesis calculations on trajectories that are uh, provided by 3D simulations. And what our framework does is it provides guidance in the sense that if you have a 3D simulation, we have our simple parameter, uh, simple semi-analytic 1D model. And based on that, we can try to get an idea of which regions are more conducive to the new P process, which ones are not. And so when you have your nice 3D simulations, you sort of know where you should be looking. And yeah, so that's basically all I have for today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Amal. Questions? Thanks for the nice talk. Um, my question was about that first bullet point. Um, so are there efforts to combine this variability with um, like population synthesis models, stellar evolution models to get at, you know, what, what is it used to be called? Uh, uh, cosmochemistry, right. galactocosmochemistry evolution. So the, there are efforts more generally for the P process. But the papers, at least the ones we have looked at, seem to sort of be dismissive of the new P process as being a viable contributor to that. So I don't know of any paper that has actually done galactic chemical evolution specifically for new P. So if you want to make a molybdenum in the new P process and niobium in alpha rich freeze out, mm -hmm. then that leaves open the possibility of some supernova to supernova variation. Right. And so do this, are these things observed in metal poor stars and is there variation seen? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it would be interesting to see if you can, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone has tried to look for niobium 92 in metal pore stars. That, that would be an interesting observation to make. Other questions? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Also, you don't see niobium. You see zirconium, and then you have to go backwards to molybdenum, uh, to niobium through the beta decay. Other questions or comments? George. Oh. So what is, why is triple alpha enhanced? And would other three body reactions with a, 
uh, also like, for example, in our process flows, uh, alpha, alpha, n to beryllium nine would, would. I think, uh, so it has something to do with the Hoyle state in carbon 12, I think. So it's, I it's, it's that correctly. state. Yeah. It's a de excitation that's. So collisional de excitation of that state. Okay, yeah, I, yeah. I get it. Yeah, I, I think and there is some, I mean, I'm, it's been a while since I looked at that nature paper, but there is also some enhancement for alpha alpha n, but they argue that it's not that important. Okay. I think, if I'm Thank you. remembering correct. Other questions or comments? If no, let's thank Amal again. Thank you.